Hey pals, before we get started, just want to mention that this episode means that we only have seven episodes left to go to the end of Miami Vice. And you know what? We have a surprise for you. During the holidays, we did a limited run of stickers for your Miami Vice podcast, the greatest Miami Vice podcast on the internet. This limited run sticker pack was a sample of five potential stickers that we would have chosen sometime probably around season three. We never got around to it and decided to go ahead and make the run now. We have plenty of those stickers left over that we'd love to offer it to our fans. The way for you to get one of these sticker packs is to go over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat and support us for just one month. Support us in the month of January. If you are a patron as of February 1st, you will get one of these sticker packs to just for being a patron in the month of January. You can support us for as little as $1 a month. So for $1, you can get this sticker pack. Head on over to patreon.com slash go with the heat to see the details and see how you can sign up. With only seven episodes left to go in the Miami Vice run, this is probably your only shot to get merch from Go With The Heat. We're coming to the end of this podcast. It's just around the corner. So you'll want to jump on this right away. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 14, titled The Lost Madonna. It originally premiered on March 17th, 1989. And it's written by Robert Gothels. This is the only episode he wrote, but he also wrote for the show Swamp Thing. Well, that Mm. explains a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I'm thinking no Emmys were won by him. I'm just as, saying, Swamp Thing does not strike me as a show to win the Emmys. As a serious fan of trash movies and TV shows, Swamp Thing is like on the Mount Rushmore of trash movies and TV shows. The show is really bad. I remember it because my dad liked to watch it. We're coming around on everything coming back. And I believe that there is a Swamp Thing series coming back for either the DC streaming service or the CW. It's one definitely of the two. A- yeah, they definitely announced a new Swamp Thing TV show for the DC streaming service. And they said it's going to be more serious like the comics. Um, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen the the stuff that's coming out for the DC TV. No, thing. I haven't. It don't look good. <laughs> All I know is I was going to get the DC streaming service. The thing that turned me off about the DC streaming series was they, they were going to make all these shows for it. For the DC base, started looking at a lot of these shows, and they are very aimed at lower age groups, like preteen level. Popular on the CW. Yeah. I watch Arrow, and I watch Flash, and those types of shows. Even these ones were a little bit too too young for me. <laughs> I was hoping that the street with the streaming service, it would go the other way. The stuff we can't show you on the CW, we'll put here. That's the way they you know. hyped the robin series i thought we were gonna get marvel netflix style shows on the dc streaming service and we're not the director is chip chalmers and this is his only directing credit he's also the assistant director for 20 other episodes so he's kind of a vice veteran and i'm gonna throw everyone for a loop on this episode this is out of the ordinary for vice and I liked it. I liked everyone's yeah. let that set in. Isn't bad. <laughs> I'm looking at you. <laughs> Before we can start, I can check in, school, join each other's lives. Pals, Melissa's on a movie streak. Last time we talked, we talked about how Melissa went and saw Creed 2 and she talked to, professed her love for Rocky and how her world revolves around Rocky. But that's, that's another thing in there that might have more of a pull than Rocky. And that is a little thing called the Transformers. And Melissa took our son to go see the Bumblebee movie, which had much hype. The hype on that is through the roof. And so I I was expecting you to come back and say, eh, but that's not the experience at all that that you had. No, we loved it. I I mean, I I can't speak for him, but (laughs) he said he liked it. But no, yeah, we absolutely loved it. And I can tell you for a fact that everybody in the theater was completely enjoying the movie. It's like one of the only movies I've went to where the people in the audience were either like laughing or crying. You know, like there was scenes that were supposed to be sad. And people were crying. There was people like yelling out things in the theater. It was like, something <laughs> like oh, okay, yeah, it's perfect for the people who love the Transformers cartoon of the 80s, the original. It's got all the nostalgia stuff that you want, the 80s nostalgia. It takes place in 1987. I'm not going to talk about anything else because I'm not going to give any spoilers, but <laughs> it's gone away from the Michael Bay extended Transformers. Oh, yeah. No, there was no, to be honest with you, there was very little, I will say that there was very little explosions. Mm. It's all about like, mm. it's like heart and 
the the girl who's in it, she was the one from True Grit, so she got nominated for an Oscar mm-hmm. for supporting actress. She's mm-hmm. a very good actress. There's no slouching in this movie. There's John Cena in this movie, <laughs> <laughs> but he, he plays the military guy. Okay, because you were John worrying Cena. me. I was starting to think it had like old Yeller endings. The kid had no. to take Bumblebee out behind the barn. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't watch a movie where Bumblebee had to go behind the barn. <laughs> I love Transformers. Like nothing touches Transformers. I, I would be crushed if they killed somebody. <laughs> Don't you touch Optimus so, Prime? So we've <laughs> we come from the Marky Mark oh, gutter yes. of Transformer movies. Yes, it's really good. It really was well written, well acted. It had the perfect amount of like eighties music and and eighties. Uh, there was even a Miami Vice reference. I, I was going to say, say let's get down to the brass tacks. Well, so where's the Vice? The Vice was in there. There was a Miami Vice. The, the one of the mm. characters goes, "I saw this on Miami Vice." When he, did, he started doing some erratic driving. <laughs> but yeah, the music's perfect. It's got all the like the popular music. And I mean, I'm a California girl, so. Some of it takes place in Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, where I was a teenager. So <laughs> a little bit of that nostalgia, too. <laughs> There's a lot of California stuff, a lot of San Francisco, the Bay Area. See, that's the way I like mm. to think about being Bay Area, too. Oh, it's cool. I know where all that stuff is. I have no desire to go back there. <laughs> yeah. I like to see it in my movies. Yeah, <laughs> I saw it in the movie. I was a little bit irritated because they were like, hey, we're going to be in Santa Cruz. And the next scene, they're by the, ba- they're by the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm like, um, you okay? This is not the way California uh, works. You can't drive that. You yeah. cannot drive that. That that doesn't work that way. They can't be in the next scene unless it's like well, a so couple hours away. We all know that you drive across uh, the Golden Gate Bridge to get to Disneyland. Yeah, like, exactly. That's the way that that works. Yeah, that would have been worse. No, but it was. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. I highly recommend it. I mean, if they're going to get the Bay Area right and they're in Santa Cruz, did they get the traffic on 17 right? Yep, it was there. <laughs> 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 I think she lives like where the house they used where she lives like was up on uh, they like, go through Felton's 17. and yeah. the curves where everyone just drives off the edge yeah because she's got like a really nice house up on the hill I'm like <laughs> come on now <laughs> oh. don't be trying to tell me that girl's poor that's what they were saying like in the movie like she doesn't have that much money well she ain't living in that house with not, not very she's much money she's up in Ben Lomond yeah. I'm so poor <laughs> yeah exactly what <laughs> Well, speaking of expensive things, we have some people who stumble upon something very expensive that clearly none of them knows anything about, (laughs) especially (laughs) Sunny, as we're going to find out very quickly in this episode. So let's go break this one down. When we open up, we're on a stakeout, Stan doing his microphone thing, duo sitting around looking through their binoculars. In the butt <laughs> yeah, van. Exactly. Why can't they all sit in the same van together? Why can't Stan be up there I, with I the don't know. <laughs> he can't. How come the ladies can't be used for anything? How come the ladies weren't even oh yeah, there's a one scene of them, yeah. There's one scene. Yeah. They, <laughs> they let them sit in the car for a little bit. <laughs> They're waiting for someone named Skianti. Poor Stan. I mean, we we're all we're almost to the end of the show. And they still haven't gotten him a buddy for the bug van. So, but luckily, he gets a buddy by the end of the episode. He won't be able to keep him. <laughs> they watch for a to come in with what they assume to be a $20 million load, as in drugs. They're waiting for $20 million worth of drugs to come in. They're like confused. It's like, why is they bringing it all in in one shot? How can they bring it into the docks? And anyway, this is all just a weird deal. But no, the scannies, this is kind of how they operate. But what's funny is Crockett's laying it out for tubs piece by piece on how how they're going to do it and how they're going to try and get away with it. If we get a little piece of evil Crockett back, oh, this is how I would do it. <laughs> I would do it like this. And I would try and distract you guys. <laughs> they see a man named Stanley. Crockett knows Stanley really well. He comes pulling up. They're even more confused now. And then two more cars come pulling in. This has got Joey and Sal of the Scanny family. And then it's got Emmanuel, who is the other person that they're going to do this deal with. Oh, not sorry, that deal with, but that boat coming in. Now it's that $20 million boat payload that was going to come in. Joey and Sal tell him, get lost. We have more legitimate business reasons. You need to hit the bricks. Emmanuel is obviously pissed. He says he'll pay an extra 300000 for them to let his boat come in. They say, you don't understand. Beat it. We're not interested. Get lost. And this is the best open in Vice history because essentially we start out with a drug bust and then the drug dealers decide, no, (laughs) no deal. No drug deal. (laughs) So like the Vice crew's kind of standing around like kind of, we've got nothing to bust now. After he turns away the drug deal, uh, they go inside and there's Cubs and Crockett are listening. Sounds like they're having a good time. Like they got a bunch of hookers in there. The whole time, there's these cats 
<laughs> meowing loudly in the background. Some cats were getting it on. That's what was going on back there. I know my cat. What the hell's going on with the cats? <laughs> Tom cats were getting some loving. One of them even comes. One of them even jumps out at, at Crockett. Joey and Sal grab a bag and they leave. They leave Stanley there by himself. Stanley gets two bags, puts it in the back of his truck, and Crockett comes walking up and says, hey, by the way, I'm a cop. I'm placing you under arrest. Stanley is in shock, but then he gets saved, almost saved, at the last minute because these two cats come jumping off the roof. And you know, Sonny, he is deathly afraid of cats. So when those cats (laughs) jump down, he just books it. The man who had a crocodile for a pet. Don't throw a cat at him. They startle him. He goes running. Shootout begins. Stanley starts shooting at Sonny. Tubbs comes walking up from behind Stanley. He tells him to freeze. Stanley turns around, fires at Tubbs. Both Tubbs and Crockett fire at Stanley, drop him. And that's the end of Stanley. And, you know, you figure their investigation. But no, yeah, they yeah. open those bags. <laughs> <laughs> they find a bunch of really bad art. So, but we'll get to the art in a minute. I just want to uh, point out that they don't have a bus. The bus falls through, but they feel like they need to shoot someone still. Like, we're here. We might as well shoot someone. Yeah, I don't um, know why they needed to because, go I mean, they could have Stanley. Because they thought he had hookers yeah. in there. They're like, oh, he's got hookers in there. They were finally going to bring back some hookers. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no one knows they're observing them. They could easily have just followed Stanley and, and the other two guys, seen what they were up to. And also they shot him and then left him there and looked through the bags, but no one calls an ambulance. <laughs> like, what if he's not dead? Well, you know what? These bags are pretty important. These plastic bags full of what could be just like styrofoam that he's throwing away. Sonny even <laughs> says, like, Stanley always knew it was going to end this way. Okay, let's get into these bags. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, like, <laughs> if, if that was caught on camera today, wouldn't there be, you know, like a snap? There'd be a, a big, uh, like, paparazzi would be like, oh my God, look at this. These, these policemen didn't do their job. They didn't even call an ambulance for this person. Yeah. And, and my advice is just everyday life. We're like, <laughs> that's not our job. We just need a body uh, here. Family's no loss. We're, we're my advice. We're undercover. We can't call the police and tell them to come pick up the body. <laughs> so they open up the bags and those paintings are in there. And they're even more confused. And then we go to the opening credits. Before we move on, this is our chance to check in with this week's guest stars. We got a big one this week. A big one. What do you got for us this week, John? Let's start off with Peter Dobson, who plays Joey Gianti. I want to start with him because it's going to start our end of Michael Mann and Dick Wolf connections. Peter Dobson also appeared in the L.A. Takedown TV movie, which would become the movie Heat. Which is your standard man connection. Gotta have one person in the episode that's... And he's shown up in, like, episodes of Party of Five. He was in a short-lived CBS series called Johnny Bago. And a few episodes of the H Tales from the Crypt. And then he's been in a few movies as well. He was in The Frighteners. He was in Forrest Gump, where he played a young Elvis. And that's then he I... was in the movie Dice, where he played this impersonator. So I think he plays Elvis pretty good. <laughs> That's what I remember him as, the young Elvis. Pretty much since the 90s, he started to uh, get behind the camera. He's He wrote and produced a movie called Choose Life, which uh, did do well at Sundance. It's about two guys who are really obsessed with the band Wham. So <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't be? He also produced a movie called Double Down with Jason Priestley, quality flicker. So and this <laughs> is Jason Priestley now. Jason Priestley... Like back when he probably guest starred with him on Party of Five. <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> like Jason Priestley was never on Party of Five. <laughs> 90210. Oh, it wasn't Party of Five. Whatever that, whatever that crappy 90s TV show 90210. was. 90210. <laughs> sure. I'm insulted for everybody on a, both of those shows right now. <laughs> hey, John. John, I'm going to blow your mind because I've never seen an episode of Party of Five. Party of Five? Not about high school kids. Party no. of Five as in a reference to a restaurant. Oh. So it's about it's about a family. Mm-hmm. It's about a family that loses their parents huh. that you own the restaurant. And yeah. they, they used to have dinner at their oh. restaurant like once a week together as a family. So I'm I'm saying that to John because I'm sure he assumed like me. It was just like a 90210 clone. No, it wasn't actually. <laughs> 90210 that's, that's was a regular thought. stupid 90s show. Actually, Party of Five. You're was telling me <laughs> that... So you're telling me that not a tree on a lone tree on a hill somewhere hey. in that show? Don't you be comparing 90210 to One Tree Hill. That's not in the same. They're not in the same atmosphere. There's significantly less trampolines in 90210. 
There are less horses, okay? <laughs> hey, for a man who likes Dawson's Creek, I don't know what you're talking about. We got a treat. So Peter Dawson's most recent, most recent <laughs> film is a short film called White Mule. She's won some awards for. Uh, run along. So let, let's let's <laughs> get to subject. <laughs> let, let's move along. So let's get to what Dominic was alluding to. The big guest star in the episode, Michael Chiklis. He plays NYPD detective Whitehead. He's pretty much at this point somewhat TV royalty. These are just the big runs of the TV shows he's been. He was in the Commish for 92 episodes from 91 to 96. He did The Shield for 88 episodes, 02 to 08. He did 20 episodes of No Ordinary Family next, then 21 episodes of a show called Vegas from 2012 to 13, and then most recently 25 episodes of Gotham. From show to show, the successful show to successful show. Just if it was just The Shield, he would be a he would be a big deal. But I mean, the commish that's I mean, a big deal. He was kind of a lull in his acting career. His first role, he was cast as John Belushi in uh, the 1989 controversial biopic Wired, which kind of flopped. And he did Vice and a few other TV shows and stuff. And then he did the commish. And then after the commish, things were kind of, he kind of hit a lull. He played Curly Howard in a TV movie, The Three Stooges, in 2000. And they decided that he was going to try and revamp, re, like reimagine himself. And so he spent six months just getting into shape and with the help of his family, just cutting down and getting ready to audition for The Shield. And he ended up getting the audition. And then he had that, you know, run with The Shield, which he won a number of awards for. On the movie side, not quite as successful. He was in the Fantastic Four franchise, the Jessica Alba one in the mm -hmm. 2005 era, including the second one, The Rise of the Silver Surfer. He played The Thing. Other movies you might have heard of that he was in, Eagle Eye, Parker, and recently he was in a movie called 1985. Obviously, he's a big guest star he was pretty pretty new to tv back when he popped up on vice but he went on to have a hugely successful career and one of my favorite things that actors do once they get all famous uh because so many of them do it in 2011 chickless and his band mcb released their first single till i come home Sweet. it's a tribute to soldiers overseas it's already been used in the TV show Modern Family, as well as being used in some movie that he was working on. Please tell me got released it's the Hootie and the Blowfish style band. Oh, God. No, I mean, I am trying to think of Michael Chiklis in a band, especially being named MCB, probably some garage country band. So Hootie and the Blowfish after the breakup. <laughs> well, let's move on. Our next guest star is Ned Eisenberg. Uh, he plays Sal Castelli. And you might remember him from such episodes as Lombard, <laughs> World of Trouble, and Yankee Dollar. The first two, he played Federico Labrizzi. And, and then in Yankee Dollar, he played Charlie Glide. He's a vice regular. He has shown up. He's more, I would say, he's shown up in equal an equal amount Michael Mann and Dick Wolf stuff. But I would say he's more a Dick Wolf guy. Because, yes, he did show up in L.A. Law and Dragnet. But... Uh, and crime story, but he also is basically the Weasley defense attorney for every episode of Law and Order and Law and Order <laughs> SVU. Every time I see him, all I can picture is when he's in Lombard and he sticks his pinky in that guy's ice cream. Because he gets ice cream Sunday like a 10 year old. Huh? <laughs> okay, so our last guest star is Elizabeth Barrage, who plays Julia Gianti. Her first movie appearance was in 1979's Natural Enemies. She would make her first appearance on TV as part of the soap opera Texas from 81 to 82. From there, not much more on the movie front. And 84's Amadeus and 99's Payback are probably her two biggest roles. Uh, but from TV, she would do 21 episodes of a show called That Power, The Powers to Be from 92 to 93, as well as 84 episodes of the John Larroquette show from 93 huh. to 96. Damn. I realized that John Larroquette was on that long. From there, she would also do Grounded for Life and 
that is your guest stars. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct, and the duo come into Dad's office, and they meet this gentleman. His name is Whitehead, Detective Whitehead, and he is the head of the art steps unit in with the New York City Police Department. Is he the whole department? Uh, uh, this is another one of those made up departments. Like like we had guy with both semen, the part of the FBI. <laughs> Now we have the art theft unit, which apparently you can't be in that unit unless you have a man bun or ponytail. <laughs> and you have to be very condescending. Yes. <laughs> I just have a question if he's the whole department. That's why he's also the head of it. Because I, he talks about going to Paris and, and living the high life. And it, I mean, every department or every you know city only has a role for one of those people. Yeah, so Sonny soaks only... it all up for Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's probably not paid like the bull semen guy, but that's because he was federal. <laughs> Whitehead says that he's been trailing the art that they found last night. Scanny stole it from the museum in Paris last year, and they think that Joey has the Madonna, and he's going to try and sell it combined with the two that the duo picked up. It's worth $17 million. While Whitehead is saying that, Sonny goes, huh, pulls out the picture and starts looking at it like sideways and front ways and starts <laughs> running his hand over the front he of starts the... starts touching it? Yeah. <laughs> he almost drops it. Whitehead almost shits himself watching Sonny you look at those paintings. And this is great. He's been such a... So condescending when he's... Whitehead is w when he's talking to him. And then he starts going in about the art stuff and he's like... Any guys know anything about art? They all just, they're all just like, no, no, we have no idea. It's a pretty picture. That's about all we know. <laughs> the big deal out of this, uh, Whitehead says he wants a full media blackout. That asks why. And Whitehead says, because if they know that the police have the other two, they'll just sit on the Madonna. They won't sell it because it's too hot to move. So they won't try to. So that means that they'll never be able to recover it. It'll just go into like the black market. Yeah, so from the sense. very beginning, Whitehead is Tracking. selling this. You got to trust me with it and don't let it go anywhere because mm -hmm. I can't wait to get my little hands on it. I don't feel like anything can go wrong. I think they're trusting Whitehead. It's rare we're going to cross the dirty cop or anything. So I think we're, we're safe. Exactly. Anyone that works for the feds or other police departments, they're always like the cleanest. Also, when they show up out of the blue and no one's told you ahead of time that they're coming. Totally He's also normal. the head of the art steps unit. <laughs> Is that a real thing? <laughs> SVU, art theft unit. <laughs> that doesn't have well, the same ring why to is it. The head, <laughs> why is the head of the New York art theft unit? Why is he going to like Paris and stuff? Like, wouldn't also, that be out of the jurisdiction? From Paris. Wouldn't the Paris police be there? <laughs> Why is New York all involved in this? Because Paris has so much art. They're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Just keep it. <laughs> keep it. You got so much. <laughs> out at the Skiannis, Sal's telling Joey that they can't find Stanley, the person who they met at the docks, or the spirits, the little pictures that, Go on the, that the vice team picked up. Joey says, no matter what, don't let my dad find out about this. Because one time I told him about a time where I lost a load and he gave me some life advice by lighting my dog on fire. He barbecued his dog. We haven't even met his dad yet. And we already know he's a prick. <laughs> um, and, and then these two clearly aren't very bright. Immediately wondering, like, how is this going to go the full length episode? The back of the precinct, the team's getting a fantastic PowerPoint presentation about art. Not the art that interests them. You know, the one, the lost Madonna that they're trying to recover. No, other art that they're being lectured on by a whitehead, including one that's like clearly just a blank image. If there's nothing there. It's like the wall. And he's like, <laughs> this and that. And, and of course, Crockett, you know, being Crockett, being just a small town boy <laughs> from Florida, <laughs> he gets up and rubs the wall. Like, there's nothing there. <laughs> I might be just a small town boy, but there's something on that picture. <laughs> Blake. <laughs> oh, so uh, what you guys are funny. talking about. It's clearly a masterpiece. Not a single <laughs> brush has touched the canvas. Yeah, and then Tubbs is laughing at him because he's up there like, even Tubbs is laughing at him like, you're so stupid, Sonny. You're making us look bad. <laughs> it's great because he's trying to like teach them art. He's basically like, this is art. You know, this is this <laughs> picture. And clearly they don't care. He he gets like frustrated near the end where I mean, he basically calls them a bunch of idiots. They shut up and listen up. It's old school PowerPoint. So I mean, it's actually like a slide deck. Yeah. So he traveled all the way from New York with his best PowerPoint slash slide deck presentation. It has nothing to do with this art. It has everything to do with just art in general. Like 
he probably gives that speech a thousand times. He decided to show up with that to the vice precinct too. Yes, uh-huh. they are too dumb to know about and, art and to teach them. So, and this is where it gets kind of silly too. It's like after the PowerPoint presentation, clearly no one's learned anything, and then out of nowhere, Stan pipes up with some random information he actually knows what he's talking about which gets whitehead all excited but at the same time fantastic but we're still not going to use you as the undercover guy we're still going to send tubs and crockett under even though exactly Stan I, yeah, clearly we said that actually too knows art yeah i'm like okay so why didn't they send him because he knows art because sonny can't have anybody go anywhere he's like i have to be involved in everything even though later on when they meet sonny they're like don't we know you like, <laughs> aren't you friends with stanley yeah. who just happens to be also missing with this art hmm that's kind of suspicious <laughs> this, is, this is clearly a problem with dad's management style here clearly crockett should have been in the van from this point forward it should have been Tubbs and Stan when the undercover work. But Dad played favorite. Him and Sonny got some kind mm-hmm. of thing. They got <laughs> that time in the hospital. Come and sit on Daddy's lap for a little while, Sonny. <laughs> so here's the plan. They're going to use this copy of a famous painting. They're going to try and sell that to the Skiannis. And then they'll be they'll be able to infiltrate the Skiannis and then figure out how to get the Madonna from them that way. So they're going to use this fake one that Whitehead happens to have brought with him for this trip, too. He assures them they'll never know the difference that it's not real mm-hmm. because they could never tell the difference. Out of the Skiannis, they're having a hell of an Olive Garden meal out on their <laughs> patio. <laughs> Spaghetti and meatballs all around. <laughs> uh, nothing gets more Italian than that, right? Spaghetti and meatballs on the terrace. <laughs> <laughs> Papa Skiani asked Joey, hey, how come we haven't talked about the Madonna? How can we be so quiet over there about it? Joey says, because we have all of them. We got all three. Everything's good. And Papa Skiani says, well, you better, because that Greek is ready with this $17 million. You all better go off and go finish selling that, which ne- never comes up again. As far as, like, they never mm-hmm. have to report back if they sold it. They're able their to dad's their never feet. in it again. Yeah. Their dad's not in it again, right? Yeah, which is extremely weird, because um, you would think he would take notice when his son, you know, never comes home again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe he doesn't like Joey very much. He's like, you know what, honey? Don't come back. I I don't know. But Joe almost blows it. The dumbass is sitting there stuffing spaghetti in his mouth. And he starts, like, describing the picture. Yeah, we got the one of the girls playing baseball and the one of the other people wrestling. Like, like he has no idea what's on these damn pictures. (laughs) Shut up. So now we're going to get to Fancy Tubbs. Fancy Tubbs (laughs) is out at the Zerum Gallery. And he talks to Julia Schiani, which I was thinking... It's sweaty time. I just, the fact that they slipped his hair back, but then left him a little bit of curl in the back. Like he didn't have enough to do a full man bun. So they left him with like a little two inch perm along the back. He's got the scarf situation happening again. Tubbs tries to lay down some painting knowledge and Julia's like, whatever. I don't care. I, it's like, I'm a, I'm a professor of art history for 10 years. She's like, that's cool, I guess. What do you want? I'm willing to bet none of that was correct either. <laughs> <laughs> he eventually gets around to, through this uncomfortableness, that he's got something for sale. So they go to the back office and she offers 200000 for that copy of the painting that they're using to set up the Scannies. They bargain a little bit. She eventually says 250 Tubbs agrees, and they're going to do the exchange at the Colonnade Hotel. So that's where we're going to go next. Now, this is when the professor, as Crockett, I mean, as Tubbs is known, not Cooper, he's the professor. <laughs> I was wondering if he gets to keep those suits or if those were in his repertoire already. No, those were his. <laughs> <laughs> so but now, guys, Stan got a buddy. <laughs> uh, Detective Whitehead is hanging out with Stan in the bug van. He's got a friend. You can finally show someone his magic. <laughs> <laughs> but Stan doesn't really like yeah. him. No. He thinks he's a jerk. He's like, mm, no. He doesn't like, he does not like that Whitehead talks, he like basically talks down about Crockett and Tubbs. And he didn't like that. You could see, he's like, okay, I don't like that crap. Those are my friends. Don't talk like that. Inside, the dealer are making a deal with Joey. Joey recognizes Sonny as being associated with Stanley, the person that they killed for the two spirits that they're in possession of. And so, of, co- that, of course, it's going to come back around on him. Because they think that Stanley and Burnett are in cahoots with hoarding the lost Madonna. Somehow Burnett is involved in that. But they're willing to make a deal for this painting. They buy it. Everyone leaves. And Whitehead is happy that the amateurs, quote unquote, were able to get it done. And that's when Stan's like, why don't you shut your stupid face? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) 
they've established contact. They sold the fake. Now they sold the fake art to them all now at this point. You know they got a terrible deal on it. I mean, she <laughs> talked them all the way down to two fifty. Seriously, it was worth nine hundred k. Like seriously, come on. All right. That aside, at this point, my immediate thought was, well, they're gonna end up trying to sell back the two paintings to the people who originally stole it. Like, wouldn't that that would make sense as part of the plan, right? We jump to a quick scene where we watch them um, on the the stolen art that they just got, which the two morons start bidding each other up. The brother and his and his <laughs> d- uh, dummy buddy start bidding each other up for no reason. So, but then we see like that's how they legitimize the paintings. Blah blah mm-hmm. blah. Then the then the plan shifts after we go to the. They call it a party. I'm assuming it's brunch. <laughs> but like we once we leave that party, we find out the plan is not the simple let's just try and sell them the paintings we already have in our possession. Why not just 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 sell them what they want? So I don't know. L- let's go back and talk about brunch. What do you guys think <laughs> about brunch? And Julia is talking to Burnett while they're having this the art <laughs> party at this brunch. And she's asking, How did you become partners? And Burnett's like, he had stolen goods i could sell we met i met him in soho at a uh, gallery in soho and he had some goods i could sell and there you go <laughs> she introduces burnett to sigmar and sigmar is like sigmar don't know you sigmar <laughs> smash <laughs> sigmar like a beefcake i don't know tommy uh, right <laughs> tommy was though it was great tommy was <laughs> Oh, uh, what's great is that um, Sully tries to fake like they know each other, and he says like, "Oh yeah, I'm so you know, so we met so and so's house, Sigmar or whatever." Weren't you with those three Chinese girls? And then he kind of gives them a, <laughs> a weird look, and it's like, like, <laughs> what did Bernadette just What was that guy to? doing with those Chinese girls? Wait a minute. Yeah, then he goes, Carson just goes along. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. me. I was that pervert. Yeah, and then Sigmar is like, "You are a very bad boy." Okay. <laughs> what did you just agree to, Sonny? <laughs> <laughs> is yes. the New York City Police Department actively looking for you now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Burnett sees Joey and Nico, their Greek buyer for the Madonna and the Spirits. They go around the corner. He gets tubs, and they go listen in on the conversation. And they find out that Joey is stalling with Nikos. He tells him, I don't have the Spirits to go with it. We're going to get them soon, and then we'll be able to package them all together. I gave you that other painting, that setup painting, at a super cheap discount. So like we're trying to take care of you here and Nikos is obviously upset. He wants to buy $17 million worth of stolen paintings. He said, you're stolen. You have another buyer. I know it. If you cross me, you will be sorry. Back at the precinct, the duo are telling Dad and Whitehead that Joey definitely has the Madonna. They know this for a fact now. They heard the conversation. They talked to him afterwards about the spirits that they might be interested in moving some things around or that they would be interested in buying Mm -hmm. the madonna because they have a big time buyer who'd be willing to spend to get it obviously joey's not that interested but just like to plant that image in his brain that he has a backup buyer that's what confuses me about their plan their whole plan hinges on them getting them to go with them as the buyer than the Greek. Joey and, and Buddy don't know what happened to Stanley. They know that Joey's in a pinch and he needs those paintings. And they also already recognize Sonny as being associated with Stanley. Try and sell him back the side paintings. I guess at that point, like Joey would say then, okay, well, you've always been, this is a hustle. And now we're just going to kill you. Seems like a way more complicated plan. What we find out is after they decide to call off the media blackout, after they, they move forward with the plan, they come over and try and muscle Tubbs anyway. Tubbs beats the hell out of one of them. <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear, their plan was that they'll lift the media blackout and then Nikos will see the heat is too hot. Yep. If he tries to buy it, it'll be too hot. He won't be able to do it. And so, therefore, the Skiannis will have no will other be choice. Desperate to move it, they'll have no other choice but to go through Tubbs or the professor and Burnett to move it. And then, when they do that, they'll be able to arrest the entire Skiani family. Essentially, yeah. <sighs> it just seems like it's more complicated than it needs to be. Now, at Tubbs' safe house, which is I don't know where they got this. This is outside of the normal part per diem for a safe house. Yeah, I mean, this is like <laughs> it's a very artistic. Yes. yes. Joey and Sal come uh, barging I, you know, in. I thought he was dreaming at first because TV said that the Heat beat the Lakers. And I was like, well, this has <laughs> got to be a dream sequence. 
Joey and Sal come barging in. This is what you were talking about, John, that they think that Tubbs or the professor has set them up, that Burnett has been in cahoots with Stanley and that they actually have the spirits. That's why they want to buy the Madonna. But the professor says, I don't know what you're talking about. It's just all in the news that the cops have the spirits. Joey has Sal take Tubbs out back. Tubbs takes care of business with Sal, you know, knocks them on the head, blammo. As we like to call it around <laughs> must here. Must have fallen in the water. <laughs> and then he comes in and tells Joey, look, I don't like doing this, but I just tried to decapitate your friend. I'm going to come in here and do it to you. I want to sell that Madonna to a friend of mine. Let's quit fucking around here and let's get business done. So that's what I mean by like, these guys aren't really a threat because Joey just immediately backs down. At the same time, didn't his dad just see this on the news? Oh, isn't his dad aware that his son just lied to him? <laughs> Once again, we, we never go back to his dad, even though his dad's the one that supposedly set all this in motion. But I have a feeling where wherever he is, he's not very happy. Because the precinct, Tubbs and Whitehead are talking. Whitehead is still being condescending. And this is when Tubbs finally snaps grabs him, throws him up against the wall. You almost got me killed for this stupid piece of art. Have some respect when you're talking to me. And Whitehead kind of talks him down. It's like, can we talk like civilized adults now? Out of Nikos, he is not happy with Joey. And the deal is off. So this is falling right into Vice's plans. That Nikos, it's too hot. He's not going to move it. He's not going to touch it. He's really upset. Sal is not doing well. And they hit him in the head again. <laughs> okay, but when was Sal ever supposed to be a tough guy? Like, who is afraid of that guy? He's little. <laughs> yeah, well, no one talks to the creek like that. So now we're going to get to the final bits of this plan. At the precinct, Whitehead is explaining to the whole vice team that he can't get the money from the NYPD, enough cash to be able to make the buy from the Skiannis. Dad says, that's fine. We'll just deal in heroin instead. We have enough heroin in there that'll, that'll be equivalent. To, as long as we get it back, We'll be all right. Whitehead then says, okay, fine. I guess that's not ideal, but that's what we'll have to go with. But I have to be involved. I have to be there. I have to be the one that does the exchange because it's artwork that's under my responsibility and it's my top priority. No one in the Vice Squad thinks anything is suspicious at this point with this guy that came out of nowhere that now says, I can't get the money. Can you spot me? Also, I have to be there. It's a little suspicious, Dad. Where are you on this one? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to the plan. So now they have to call up the other guys and say, hey, instead of typically paying money for this art piece, we'll give you heroin. This seems like a, a very difficult thing to talk them into. We're going to trade you heroin for, for you know, for yeah, the but, Madonna. Yeah, but Sonny is right. He says he knows the ski and he said that they're willing to make a deal. When the professor calls Joey and he tells him he's got four pounds of heroin willing to trade, Joey almost jumps out of his shoes. He's so excited to make this deal. Because it's super pure. The stuff mm -hmm. they got is supposed to be whatever they call it, like four or something, whatever the name of it is. But it's like very pure heroin. So that's why he's like, yeah, like we're getting it. We're getting a steal. Basically, you're giving me too much for what this pain <laughs> is. Joey stops off to see Julia and the Madonna, which is just hanging up on the wall inside of her house. He's going to take it with them, obviously. He talks about how it reminds him of a girl in high school that would do chairs from one of the grandstands and then tells his sister, if you weren't related to me, I'd hit you with a baseball bat. You know, normal family stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mean every family has that. Oh, she's <laughs> got to learn respect. You know, like she's getting on him about trading it for drugs. Doesn't she know that drugs raised her? That they changed their diapers? Drugs stayed up with her in the night? And now it's time for the sting. They're out at the professor's house. Tubbs is waiting. The entire hey, team is the there. Ladies. <laughs> the ladies are there. Everyone is there except for dad, obviously. But everyone's there. Stands the guard at the front gate. Ladies are there waiting in their car. Duo are inside with Whitehead. Joey comes in, not thinking anything is up. He just comes in. It's like, here you go. Here's the box. Let me see the heroin. He even's like, hey, why are we in a rush? Let's party a little bit before we get out of here. He doesn't see anything wrong that's happening here. It's it's so obviously a setup, especially since they got Stan in this spiffy rent-a-cop uniform. Like they come in and they're like, I Let's see the money. But then, uh, like, after they see the money, you know, when he's, like, talking about partying and doing drugs, you know, like, oh, no drugs for me. Yep, yep. Those are the drugs. That's <laughs> the money for it. The professor isn't having anything of that. 
He says, no, let's, I want to, I want to get my hands on it right now. Whitehead goes out alone with Joey to go get the Madonna. No other police officers go with them. Whitehead knocks out Joey, takes the Madonna, calls in on the radio, says officer down. So all the officers, including the ladies go running in. Whitehead runs over to the lady's car, steals it and drives away. He's able to get off scot-free, the easiest fake out in the history of fake outs. And he leaves him looking like idiots. Would have gotten away with it, except he had to run his mouth about his pension cruises. <laughs> Joey just happens to wake up in time to see him drive away. He gets in his car and drives away. So Joey, the number one person they were there to arrest, gets away. And so does Whitehead with the only artifact that they wanted to bust. Everything escapes. The only person they have now is Sal, who saw the cops, and then it's too late, turns around and sees that Tubbs and Crockett have pulled their badges out, and all the police come running in. But like you said, John, he ran his mouth about like, taking cruises and then being in Paris, so everyone rushes off to the port to go see if they can catch him before he gets on a boat in the slowest getaway. I mean, this is Rastafarian popsicle slow getaway style. <laughs> I think they'd be Funny able that to catch you a cruise that. ship. Funny that you mentioned that because did you notice all the mo the majority of the passengers on this particular cruise? <laughs> I'm willing to bet them somewhere like Jamaica because there is a <laughs> lot of Rastafarians on this cruise. <laughs> Whitehead even tries to to hide himself as being a Rasta in Mike. the crowd. <laughs> Joey is looking for him, and so are the police. So everyone's there at the same time. Whitehead sees Joey. He goes or. He sees Sonny. He goes running out in like a stairwell, goes down to an area that's like uh, under construction or something. That's when Joey catches up with them. Joey comes walking up and says, just make this easy. Give me back the Madonna and beat it. Whitehead says, not so fast, pal. Bang. Shoots Joey. Joey's in shock. Who thought he was like a young kid who thought he'd just live forever. He goes down. Whitehead runs out. That's when Tubbs and Crockett see him running outside. Run down, they see Joey's been shot, and they catch Whitehead outside, and Sonny does his best Florida tackle, which is, you know, not really that great, but good <laughs> enough to get the job done. <laughs> and when he does it, he knocks the Madonna out of Whitehead's hands. It falls on the ground, cracks into a thousand pieces, and Whitehead is just in shock that both he got caught and that the priceless piece of art that he loved so much is now broken and gone forever. Let's address Joey. Joey's a moron and deserves to be shot. He's standing there <laughs> with a gun on him. He's got him caught, everything. And he just stands there and lets him basically pull a gun and shoot him. So he deserves to get shot. And I'm not sad that he's not going to make it home for his dad to barbecue him. <laughs> as far as Whitehead goes, clearly, I made fun of him about the Rasta disguise. But, but the dress was helping him. He was a lot more mobile with, <laughs> with the lack of pants. <laughs> I, I'll say that. You're right. That was kind of a lame tackle. It was kind of a more got him with the arms, spun him kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, I love the zero disregard for the priceless piece of art. <laughs> so, as we find out at the very end, uh, none of that matters. Yeah, we go back to the Skiannis, and Julia is there with Sigmar. And Sigmar's like, wine, good. <laughs> I love Sigmar you. drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny walks in and meets his Sigmar. Like, I crush you. Comes running across the room, swings at Sonny, who dodges it easily. And Sigmar runs down like an 80 foot long hallway. It runs into the wall. <laughs> hits his head, gets knocked out. And then Sonny goes into this long speech about how he knew that Julia was the one that would only recognize which one was real and which one was fake. And that Whitehead was hurt because he was both duped and thinking that he broke it. All right, and all right. Just hurt me. Like, seriously. He just goes on and on and on. I just tried to stab him too. <laughs> like, like, damn it. Just put damn handcuffs on me and take me to jail. I don't want to hear all this. Julia does try and eventually try to seduce him. And he says, nah, I think I'll pass after telling a story about this other painter artist that got his hand cut off for not making something that this other person likes and stuff. <laughs> I'm so glad know. that the story resonated with you. <laughs> so long that yes. it just gets to the handcuff point where he does that and he walks her out and that's the end of the episode. Thank yeah, God. and to be fair, I don't think she... I don't know if she was coming on him, uh, coming on to him to try and get him to let her go. I think she was confused by the situation because he started going off on a tangent for a minute. There, it kind of felt like maybe like he thought they were on a date or something. <laughs> like he just stood there holding 
in her hand for so long telling her this story about the artist. I, I wasn't sure if he was going to cut her hand off at the end. <laughs> this is true to form for Vice because whenever there's like a double cross of a double cross, like that, Sonny's the only one that ever puts it together. Because he's the only smart one. And he <laughs> comes alone to like, <laughs> I figured out your double cross. Yeah, exactly. And at least this time. The person didn't get away with promising him full payday, and then he realizes that he got duped again <laughs> with an empty briefcase, <laughs> like in that episode yeah. with the <laughs> with that guy that convinces everyone that he's oh the bull semen, bull semen, yeah, 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 with the, the bull, bull semen. semen episode, yes. It's Dan, yeah. it's Sonny, it's everybody. I have many more thoughts though <laughs> on oh, this episode. And like I said, I'm going to defend it. I liked it. I liked it. Regardless of what look I'm getting from Melissa right now. <laughs> Before we do, and given our final thoughts, let's go talk about this week's music. Let's go over there and talk about this one. All right, John. Music this week is one band we've heard from before. And one, I'm just anticipating your pronunciation. Your pronunciation. Your pronunciation. <laughs> Pronunciation. I'm, anticipating your pr- <laughs> I'm anticipating your pronunciation too. <laughs> and what I'm just waiting for you to talk about because I've never heard of this band before. <laughs> what do you got for us this week, John? All right, so let's start with the person we have seen. We have She's Waiting by Eric Clapton, aka Slow Hand. Eric Clapton's shown up in the music a little uh, quite a bit. He's also shown up in quite a few episodes. So his music has appeared in One Eyed Jack. Phil the Shill. And then we also had the Derek and the Dominoes appearance a few weeks ago as well. So I feel like I've talked about Clapton quite a bit. I talked about him during his Derek and the Dominoes period just to try and find some new things to talk about him. One, he's the only three-time Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee. So, which that's pretty impressive. He's He was inducted as a solo artist, but also as members of the bands Cream and the Yardbirds. So he actually might get a fourth time if they decide to bring Derek and the Dominoes in. Outside that impressive stat, he really is ranked as being one of the greatest guitarists of all time. In my opinion, rightfully so. Rolling Stone had him ranked second in their 100 Greatest Guitarists of All Time, as well as The Times had him number four in their 10 Best Electric Guitar Players list. For what it's worth, Eric Clapton said that the greatest guitarist ever is Prince. So Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that Prince would be on either of those lists as well, or they should be. So even though people don't always think of him as a guitarist. So he was born in Ripley, Surrey, England, and he came out during one of the biggest music revolutions in London history, basically. He started joining bands when he was about 16, and... He was really coming up through when Jimi Hendrix was living living in London. Also, there was a really big blues movement that was running. A lot of blues artists from America were getting paid more overseas. Last thing, to get into Clapton too much, I'll just leave you with one last note that I thought was pretty interesting. When he was born, his mom was 16 years old, and his dad was a 25-year-old Canadian soldier. His dad shipped out and then never came home. His dad basically went back to Canada after serving in the military. Eric Clapton actually grew up thinking that his grandmother Rose and her uh, and her husband were his parents, and that his mom Patricia, his older sister. I thought that was pretty interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's so. Let's get to the one that you really want to hear about: "Twist in My Sobriety." Anita Karam. Perfect. I think I got it, guys. Perfect. I don't right think I messed that up at all. That was a, that was a first pitch home run. <laughs> she is a pop folk singer. I love that combination. Pop folk singer. <laughs> the 80s was such a weird time. <laughs> she was actually born in Munster, Germany. Her father was a career military man. She actually lived in Germany for most of her early life before moving to Hampshire, England. She started singing in nightclubs as a teen and got signed by WEA Records. Her debut album, Ancient, Ancient Heart, which featured this song and her other hit, Good Tradition. It was released in 1988, and she was only 19. Twist in My Sobriety and Good Tradition were both top 10 hits around Europe and actually sold over 4 million worldwide. So she immediately out of the gates, jumped out, and was successful. Her next three albums that followed that, not nearly as successful. In fact, <laughs> each album sold fewer than the last. To the point that she took a break from music in 92. 
it's like, like things are just keeping a little worse and a little worse and then selling a little <laughs> less. She moved to San Francisco, probably started doing yoga, returned to music in about 1995 with the album Lovers in the City. It got better reviews, but still wasn't quite good enough to keep her, uh, get her a new contract. So her WEA contract would finish out with a 96 best of album. Since then, she's released a few albums with a couple smaller labels. She's retired once. And then since 2013, she's been touring the UK and Europe mostly. She's still around if you really want to look for it. I had never really heard of her, but I will be Googling at least one of her two movie appearances after this. She appeared in a 2012 French film called By Morocco, where she sings a jazz tune called Blue Gardenia, which is actually a real famous jazz tune. I might look that one up, or I could be looking up the 94 film Erotique, which <laughs> she was in a segment directed by Monica Schutt. Uh, where she plays a secretary that interrupts two people having coitus. So mm. I, I I might look up the Blue Gardenia <laughs> song. I might look up the the, the, the secretary. I don't know. <laughs> That's about all. I tried to see if Tanita would carry us a little further, but just just not a lot there. She just struck me as someone that's huge in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> that would make so much sense. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode and see where we all stand. I've tipped my hand. I've said I'm going to defend this episode. I'm interested to see where everyone else is at. Let's go give our final thoughts. John, kick us off. I have a feeling you're going to be like, eh. So let's see where you're at. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. It, it's an okay, it's an average episode. I am still disappointed in the lack of speaking role uh, lines for our female co-stars. Felt like the ladies could have said at least one word in this episode. You know, maybe <laughs> two. But aside from that, this, this is the most Vice, like early season, uh, earlier season Vice episodes that we've had, I feel, in season five. It even had the same plot holes. So, like, like everything fit. <laughs> I can't complain too much about music, so there was someone that we I, I hadn't talked about. We actually got a decent guest star this week. He was probably cheaper to afford back then because he was just starting. But still, you know, finally we got a, a big name. So all in all, you know, pretty good. We're doing pretty good episode-wise. So, I mean, I wasn't blown away by anything with the episode. It wasn't like... It didn't speak to me on any other levels. And the thing I learned is that whether or not they do a drug bust, they're going to shoot someone. <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I don't like this episode. Like The only redeeming quality thing about this episode is Tubbs's hair and his, <laughs> his wardrobe. <laughs> I don't even like the guest star. I didn't think he added anything to it. <laughs> I'll be that person. <laughs> this episode is not good. It's boring. I don't care. I don't care about the Madonna. I didn't care about the spirits. I didn't care about any of it. I didn't care about Joey or his dead barbecue dog. <laughs> I didn't like it. I don't like it. It's it's too it's too much. Too too much too much zaniness for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, allow me to defend this episode. Oh, let's, let's, let's I'm gonna to defend this. its honor. And John hit the nail on the head. This is classic vice, as in it's a serious storyline. It's off the beaten path a little bit. I do like it when they do the cocaine cowboys best, though those are my favorite episodes. But when they go off script, when they're this wasn't like the FBI asks us to be involved with this. They actually stumble on it. They think that they're going to do a drug bust with this guy, Emmanuel, and they stumble into the art. So they're kind of locked into it because it's the Scanny family and their drug dealing ways. So there's a legitimate reason why they should be mixed up in this. It's zany. It's fun. They have a little bit of fun here and there. They make some jokes here and there. It's kind of goofy at times, which is in season one and season two of Vice. That's what's really good about those episodes is that it doesn't take itself so seriously that it can't have a little bit of fun every once in a while i'm with john on the ladies most i know you've mentioned me before it's like keep asking for it because you're not going to get it you ain't like, getting it yeah that's more than you're going to get for the rest of the season <laughs> the ladies are non-existent they did something to piss off the writers i don't know what it was <laughs> but yeah this felt more like a original episode of vice than it did season five that burnett story arc man it really messed with all the storylines after it. And this is what I loved about Miami Vice is that 
They have the team, they're working undercover, they get double crossed by double cross, and they have to, they get mixed up in something that's probably n- none of their business, and occasionally they have a little bit of fun doing it. That's when Vice is at its best. That's what that's the way I like Vice, and I kind of miss it from season two, and we get it every once in a while. That's my defense to this episode. But there was no fun in this episode. What part was fun <laughs> for Tubbs? <laughs> Wearing that stupid <laughs> scarf on his neck. That's what I'm saying it's like it's not necessarily that they're fun that they're fun. It's like the show is aware of its yeah, like, like a little bit of cheese factor being put into it. You see this not just how Tubbs like his hair, but you see the suits he was wearing. Oh yeah, there was some cheese factor. <laughs> oh that. yeah. Yeah. The, best uh, part the, of the, episode the was polka Sigmar. dot <laughs> the, the polka dot bow tie. Academic tubs is the best on undercover tubs, no matter how much we love Jamaican tubs. The best on the cover is Academic Tubbs because uh, he's way out of his league. No, the best is Jamaican <laughs> Academic. Combine them yes. and you've got Super Tubbs. I was going to say. Beat him. <laughs> I was going to say I was a little let down that there was no accent involved. I was hoping yeah. for a British accent. <laughs> Something. Come on. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us goewiththeheat at gmail.com. Check out that website, goaltheheat.com. You can find all the other ways to contact us, including Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, not Tumblr anymore with the porn band, but you know, you get the point. Like you can find us all over the place. You can get a hold of us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this episode. Set us straight. Good, bad, in the middle. Defend my defense. Defend me. I have everyone against me. Defend me from my wife. <laughs> And for Help those of you go- trying to Google it, the <laughs> film is Erotique. It's E R O T I Q U E. You're so. welcome. <laughs> we would love to hear from you. By the way, this is episode 14. We are that close to being done with Miami Vice. So we would love to hear from you. Get in there while you still have the chance. The other thing I would like to mention is, like I mentioned at the top, we have a very special sticker pack going on right now. If you subscribe to our Patreon for as little as $1 a month, you make a pledge for $1. And on February 1st, that $1 comes through, we're going to send you a custom sticker pack that we made. It was a limited run. We don't have that many copies of it. We made it kind of like for ourselves around the holidays. We have some extras. We're going to give them out to pe- to fans of the show. For $1, you can get that sticker pack. Five custom stickers designed by our own Jenna Barham, who is in our season one show. She designed those stickers. You can get those for as little as $1. Subscribe to our Patreon. We're giving it away to everyone who subscribes to our Patreon. So make sure to go check that out. There's other ways to support us, too, other than that Patreon where you can get that free sticker pack. And then you can also email us, goldheat at gmail.com. But we would love to see a review of the show, in particular with iTunes. If you have a chance to go give us like a five, you know, that, something simple, just a five-star review. You know, the most glowing review that you can give us. Go over there and give that to us when you have a chance. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. You know what? You know what the worst cookie is? I'm just going to go ahead and say it peanut butter. (gasps) Oh! I, you know, I can't argue with you there. Um, <laughs> it doesn't do anything for me. So, you just uh, said you like oatmeal raisin uh, cookies. <laughs> I do. I do love oatmeal raisin. And if you make it with the right, if you make it with brown sugar, you, you know, like they're they're delicious. They're the best damn cookie in the world. Peanut butter is below do that for me. They're usually Oh, please. Chocolate chip cookies are not even that good there. I said it. Now we're just saying things you can't take back. There. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> Gonna do a cookie podcast after this. <laughs>